So Doyle Brunson once said that sometimes in the game of poker, uh, you learn more from your losses than you do from your wins. So i uh, give you a little foreshadowing. Even in the last video, I showed you guys uh, that we ended up losing quite a substantial amount here. And I won't give that away. Stay tuned until the end to find out. But um, yeah, in this video, uh, we're going to see what we can learn from all of our possible losses and all of these hands. I do go into an in-depth analysis. I got a lot of good feedback from that. So we're going to continue doing that. Also, I got a lot of uh, viewers that were telling me that it's easier if I have the graphic of the card out versus a picture of the card. So we're going to continue to do that. Um, but yeah, uh, this video uh, that you guys are going to watch, I'm basically going to see me get a beating and uh, it's pretty rough. Um, even just re-watching it and reliving it, I'm like, oh my God. Normally what I tell my students is, uh, limit yourself to three buy-ins. If you limit yourself to three buy-ins, anytime you play PLO, if you're buying in for a 500 or a 1,000, make sure if you're buying in for 500, bring 1,500. If you're buying in for a 1,000, bring 3,000. In this situation, we went over the three buy-in mark. Normally, my rule is, is after three buy-ins, if you're still losing, the card gods are telling you that it's not your day to play. And uh, I think the other things that I can take from this to reflect is... The possibility that, you know, sometimes when it's your last day on a long poker trip, maybe you just shouldn't play poker. And I know that sounds really weird. So we have a couple of meetup games coming up for all of you guys, especially if you happen to be in Texas. We're still trying to finalize a deal in Las Vegas for Super Bowl weekend. But besides that, if you are going to be in Texas, anytime in the Georgetown Poker Club area, so that's around Austin, it's 20 minutes from Austin, uh, we're going to be there February 16th, 17th, and 18th in the evenings for an official meetup game. Uh, if you are a member of Georgetown Poker Club, you can go ahead and sign up on a pre-made sign-up list. That's what we're going to do. Same thing goes for uh, Dallas. We're going to end up, uh, Donkfish Poker and I are going to end up being in Dallas on February 24th at the Hideaway. So if you're at the Hideaway... Again, we're going to have a pre-sign-up sheet for our meetup game on the February 24th. And then on February 25th, we're going to be in Houston at Poker 101 and Richmond uh, Avenue. So again, we're going to have a pre-made sign-up list for that. So definitely sign up. The game is going to be 125 Big O uh, with a $200 to a $1,000 buy-in. Of course, because it is Texas, you guys are used to having bigger buy-ins. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, whether or not it's capped or uncapped, uh, I'm pretty okay with either one. I'm just going to, we're going to feel out the players, but initially we're going to start off with a $200 to a $1,000 buy-in. So really looking forward to seeing you guys there. Uh, our last meetup game at Rockford went really well, Rockford Charity Group. You know, there's some people that I talked to both before and after that told me that they had, uh, you know, allowed players to shuffle cards and that they want to go back there because of that. I assure you, players don't touch cards. Dealers are the ones that are always shuffling the cards. Um, they're, they're very professional there. Uh, they ran it very well. And it had that home game feel. Uh, and, of course, they allow vloggers. So if you are in Chicago, Rockford Charity Group's a great place to play. Plus, it's actually a place that I think I'm probably going to go there, uh, you know, probably two times a month and see if we can get a big O game going like every Friday or something to that effect. But it was great to meet all the people down there. And, uh, you know, so stay tuned, watch the video. Let me know what you guys think. Uh, how do you guys deal with the loss yourself? Um, generally what I do is I take a little bit of break and I go play video games or I build puzzles, things like that. I try taking my mind off of poker when I have a bad run like this. So um, let me know what you guys do when you have a bad run, what's your best way of like taking a break and then coming back? So leave me uh, some comments down below. And as always, uh, you know, hit the like and subscribe button. That really helps the channel. So play smart, everybody. Run like a god.
So in this first hand of in-depth review, we're going to look down at Ace-Ace-King-6. This is a premium. I've already raised it. Uh, I raised it up to $60. I was in the straddle, so everybody limped. When it gets back to me, I make it 60 And, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing a, a medium size raise when you have like a hand like this, but I also don't mind putting in a, a max pot size bet every once in a while with a hand like this, especially since you're going to have more equity than your opponents. We end up getting five callers, so there's $300 into a pot. Now, let's just talk about this for a minute. Anytime you get this many callers with aces, unless it comes some kind of clean flop, you're not going to continue very much. And what's a clean flop? Obviously, an ace is a clean flop. Maybe something like king x, because we are blocking top set. So in this situation, when the board does come king 3, 7, I know that there's going to be a lot of draws out there, but here's the thing. I am blocking top set. I do have an over pair. Uh, I'm guessing somebody with diamonds is going to call. Uh, somebody with some kind of wrap draw is going to call. So I end up betting $140 into the field. Now the first player ends up mucking. Second player ends up mucking. The third player uh, ends up going for into the tank for a little bit. And then they end up calling. So I'm figuring uh, that's probably my opponent who has a diamond draw. That's my guess. Uh, and I've got position on the next person who's going in the tank a little bit. And uh, the next person ends up calling as well. So we are actually going to go three ways to the turn here. Now, let's just pause this for a minute. So when we are going three ways to the turn at this particular junction, there's two things out there that I was thinking of that one of my opponents probably has king seven somehow and my other opponent has a diamond draw so really I'm done with this hand unless an ace comes up or a three if a king does come up it's less likely my opponent has king seven and I'll continue with that but pretty much any other card in the deck uh, unless it's a deuce like four through queen I'm pretty much going to shut it down so when I see the three I feel like the three bailed me out so the first two opponents they both check it to me, and at this point, I'm like, you know what? I think I need to put max pressure in here, so I go ahead and I bet pot. Again, I'm targeting hands that are going to be like ace high diamond draw, maybe king seven. Obviously, the first player mucks real quick. Second player goes in the tank for a little bit, and then they go ahead and decide to call. Now, when they call, I am really done with the hand, but at the same time, I think we only have about $200 effective, so... There's so much money in the pot at this point that if he does jam all in when a diamond comes on the river, I'm going to call him no matter what. So at this point, I didn't really understand the call, but, you know, I don't mind players who want to save $200, and I wouldn't mind saving $200 either. So when he checks it over to me because the queen comes out, I feel that's a pretty safe card. I end up checking it back. My opponent, he ends up turning over 3, 4, 5, 6 for the rivered or for the turn three of a kind. So the card that I thought bailed me out actually ended up killing me. Sometimes that happens. I think my mistake in this situation was going to the flop five ways with pocket aces, really unless you spike an ace. Uh, and yeah, I was blocking top set, but like betting $140 on the flop, yeah, it's a half pot size bet, but just betting that was like extremely hopeful. And then I just felt like since the three got there and it was like one of my few safe cards that I might as well continue with it. And then it ended up just backfiring. So it's a high variance play. Uh, a lot of times if your bankroll is smaller, you're just better off just checking that flop back uh, and just proceeding with a little bit more caution. So taking a look at this hand, we end up looking down at 8, 10, 5, ace, double suited. So we have ace high diamonds, we have 10 high hearts, and uh, we end up making it 15. We have a suited ace, and the guy right behind me who is leaning on me during the session ends up 3-betting to $50. Now, what are the types of hands that people are going to 3-bet with? Usually some type of uh, 3 or 4 cards to Broadway, pocket aces, obviously, pocket kings, anything like that is what somebody should be 3-betting it with. So... This is a hand that's actually not that bad to defend a three bet with. So we get another act, another player that ends up calling, and we end up going three ways to the flop. Now the flop comes out, ace, four, six, complete rainbow. We do have backdoor diamonds, and we have backdoor hearts. So we do have two backdoor draws. We do have a gut shot draw. So this type of flop is actually going to favor our range quite a bit because any type of rundown hand we can represent since we were the original raiser. So we could have a hand like four, five, six, seven. Now we do have another player that's with us, which is perfectly fine, but I really don't mind 
this hand three ways because I can represent a lot of different things here. I can obviously represent a6 is definitely within my realm of representation, especially since I have ace8 and ace5 in my hand. So in the situation like this, I'm going to do some kind of value bet. There's $150 in the pot. I do want to apply a little bit of pressure, so I'm going to bet about two-thirds. So I end up betting $115. Now the player behind me, now he's a pretty experienced PLO player, so he can obviously call with a w wide variety of hands. He ends up making the call. Now what kind of hands can he have? Being an experienced PLO player, he could certainly have like an ace with three overs to the six. So he could have like a rundown hand like ace king, queen jack, ace queen jack ten, something to that effect where he's looking to pick up some equity on the turn. And that I'm perfectly okay with. He can he also, as the three better, could have some kind of rundown like four, five, six, seven, or five, six, seven, eight. However, we are blocking those since we do have a five and an eight in our hand. So it's really unlikely that he has some type of hand like that. So it's most likely he's got like one pair of aces with three overs is what I'm putting him on. Now, the other player that's in the pot with us, uh, he's going in the tank for a little bit, and he actually decides on making the call. Now, at this point, when he does make the call, I'm thinking to myself, what is going on here? This is a hand that, okay, maybe the person who three bet it has some kind of Broadway rundown, and maybe the other guy does have some kind of rundown, like five, seven, eight. So in this situation, when you have a situation like this, you have to be aware that if a seven peels off, even though you might turn the nuts, you might actually end up being playing for half the pot. So when we do get two callers here, I'm really looking to improve. If I don't improve, I'm shutting down the hand. Now the turn comes the 10 of clubs. This is actually vastly improves our hand because if somebody was calling us with a six, now all of a sudden we caught up. So in a situation like this, I'm going to turn up the heat. I'm going to do a full pot size bet. So I bet out $500. I'm doing this to charge everybody who has any kind of draw the maximum out there. If I think if somebody had pocket fours or pocket sixes, which is really unlikely in a three bet pot, which is one of the main reasons why you do three bet when you do is to get low pocket pairs like that out of the way. So in this situation, I'm figuring ace 10 is pretty much the nuts. I do have a backup plan in case uh ace 10 is no good that a seven can come out so i end up betting 500 dollars. the first player thinks about it for a little bit and uh yeah he ends up uh, making the call now when he ends up calling the other player is now going in the tank quite a bit and at this point i'm like wow the other guy probably does have some kind of rap draw uh, and that the three better, the original three better probably has like ace 10, queen king, ace 10, jack queen. So at this point, I'm really hoping for the board to pair. He ends up calling. I'm like, oh my. River ends up coming in eight of clubs. So backdoor clubs does get there. There's $2,000 in the pot. Uh, I only have $300 in front of me. First player decides to check. I go ahead and say, you know what? I'm going to check this hand here. Uh, it does give my opponent an opportunity to bluff if they did have something like a six now or a eight. So my opponent behind me elects to go all in. He goes all in for 750 effective. The other player does have about 400 in front of him, maybe about 500 in front of him, but I've only got 300 in front of me. So the other player goes in the tank for a little bit, ends up mucking it, and then I'm like, oh my god, I've only got to be right one out of like eight times. And I'm just like... This is really rough. Uh, you know, it's it's one of those situations where I hate calling, but there's just so much money in the pot that, you know, I can call. Um, I do have an eight as well to block, you know, if he does have ace eight. So it really just screams that he has a straight. But he's actually a good enough player to try bluffing on the river here if that was the only way he could make uh, he could win the hand. So I end up deciding if that's a, if that's what he concluded, then yeah, I got to put the chips in on the off chance that he doesn't have it. And he ends up turning over ace, queen, jack, five with queen high clubs. So we had a good read on him for a three betting and he just happened to back into clubs and we end up losing this one. You know, in hindsight, looking back at this, you always got to ask yourself, is there anything that I could have done differently to play the hand differently to you know either win the pot or try not to lose the pot and in all seriousness um, I think the hand pretty much played itself unfortunately that's going to happen in Omaha sure there are lines they could have taken that could have been a little bit more conservative 
but uh, my style of play with a high V-pip, I play a little bit more aggressive to get more action back at me. So in that situation, I don't think there's anything I could do differently, which sucks. Taking a look at this next hand, we end up having king, four, eight, jack with three spades. Now, by no stretch of the imagination is this a good hand. I want to talk about the quality of the hand here just for a second. This is not a good hand whatsoever. This is not something I'd recommend you playing unless you have a particularly splashy player uh, playing at the table or a whale that you're trying to entertain of some sort. So by no stretch of the imagination is this a good hand, but I was in the straddle uh, and we end up getting five ways to the flop. Flop ends up coming out pretty favorable for us, four, four, seven. So we do pretty much nail the flop. So when it checks to us, uh, we are gonna bet, we end up betting $25, we get two callers. Now the two people that called me end up being pretty splashy. They've been splashy all game. Now the turn comes a jack and the first player ends up betting out $50. Now in a way, this is a little bit of a blocker bet. If he does have ace four, if he does have hearts here, if he does have a diamond draw, because there's two diamonds and two hearts on the board, um, I could see him betting $50. And this was actually a player I played with uh, uh, earlier in the year uh, during the World Series, and he played higher stakes. I believe I played 5, 10, 25 with him. So he's pretty capable of doing quite a few different things. So I end up calling, and the player behind me ends up snap calling. So again, splashy game. River ends up coming a 10 of hearts. So now the heart draw is completed and the first player ends up checking to me. Now when they check to me and I do have fours full, basically the nut full house of fours, I'm going to end up betting for value. So the types of hands that I'm going to target here are any types of flushes or worse full houses. So I'm going to bet a little over half pot size bet. I'm going to bet $140. And, uh, so I'm, that's really what I'm trying to target again is any type of ace high flush is there. And this guy ends up calling right behind me. So the next player right behind him, he decides to announce pot. So let's go ahead and pause this here for a second to talk about what he could have. So anytime somebody check pots at particularly in PLO and particularly on the river, it usually signifies that they have the stone cold nuts. Now, if you are facing a formidable opponent, they are going to mix in some bluffs with this. So one of the things you have to ask yourself if you're faced with a check pot situation like I am right here, do you ask yourself is one, is your opponent capable of bluffing? Two, if they are capable of bluffing, are they basically like in the mood to bluff or, or have you seen them bluff before? And in this individual right here, as I mentioned before, I actually played with him playing 5, 10, 25. Uh, during the series, this is an individual that is perfectly capable of bluffing. However, when you're playing 1-2 PLO, just as a general rule, if somebody check pots you on the river, unless you have the stone cold nuts, don't end up calling. But I do end up allowing my previous experience with this gentleman make a decision that uh, ends up being a bad decision. I end up saying to myself, I, I basically level myself. I say, is he capable of bluffing here? He is capable of bluffing. He could also be doing it with four jack and just doesn't want to chop the pot, trying to charge all four sevens or four tens. Um, so at this point, I know that it's very possible that he's got four jack, four ten, four seven. He could have pocket sevens, obviously. So I know that there's a possibility that I'm just beat. So I end up calling, particularly because it's only $500, uh, so it's only another 360 for me to win, you know, a total of like 12, 1300 bucks. And he ends up showing us pocket jacks. So I end up punting and say Merry Christmas. So we lose this one. Looking back at one of my rules as far as check potting in 1-2 PLO, uh, just as a general rule, people don't bluff in 1-2 PLO when they check pot the river. So uh, in hindsight, I probably should have just folded this hand, obviously. Now let's take a look at this next hand here. Uh, it ends up being $15 before the flop, uh, and I'm in middle position here. I end up looking down at 9, queen, queen, 4. So you can't see it there because my big old hand is blocking it, but uh, this hand ends up showing you uh, exactly how good I was running during this session. So the flop comes queen, 10, 5, complete rainbow. So we flopped basically gen. It checks around to us. I'm going to do some kind of value bet. I end up betting $50. I believe there's 75 in the pot. 
player behind me ends up raising. He raises to 175. So in a situation like this, I'm thinking, I really hope he flopped a set of tens. He could have flopped some kind of wrap draw. No matter what, I'm just going to proceed with a little caution here. I'm going to play this one a little sneaky. I'm going to go ahead and flat because if he's got a set of tens, he should be following it up with a pot size bet. As long as it's a clean turn. Now the turn is the three, a black three, three of clubs. Obviously, this card is our gen card. We are going to end up check raising. That is the plan here. Uh, and because if he does have some kind of wrap draw or maybe just a naked straight draw like nine jack, he's probably going to check back, and I'm okay with that uh, just because I've been running so bad. But I'd end up checking. He ends up potting it, so I end up check raising all in. He calls. I tell him, sure, we can run it twice uh, just because I've been bitten a little bit. Clean run out on the first one is a three. Second run out ends up being a king. He ends up showing nine jack king, and we end up getting half this pot. You know, in hindsight, you can say anything you want, like, oh, maybe we shouldn't have ran it twice because he only had one card to go. I mean, that's pretty valid. I mean, running it twice is just lowering the variance. But this just goes to show you that sometimes it doesn't matter what you can do in the world. Sometimes the card gods are just pissing in your mouth. Now, looking down at this next hand, it's $15 to go pre-flop. We're going to look down at Ace-Queen-5-Deuce with a suited Ace-Queen of Diamonds. So we do have Ace-Queen-Deuce-5. We have a, a wheel draw, if you will, or a low uh, draw, so the, the, they're not going to play very often, but Ace-Queen of Diamonds is pretty good. Oh, my goodness. So the flop comes 5-6-Queen with two hearts, one diamond, we do have backdoor diamonds here. Now we flop top and bottom pair. So we're, when it checks to me, I am going to end up charging all types of draws. Now the types of hands that I'm targeting right here are going to be hands like 7, 8, 9, 4, 7, 8. Uh, if somebody's got queen 6, I'm going to hear from them. But uh, So those are the type of hands that I'm targeting. So we end up getting uh, one caller, and then we get one other person who like sits there, and he goes in the tank for a little bit. And the person who ended up calling me is directly to my left. He's basically had my number all day, uh, which, you know, sometimes that happens. But the guy ends up going in the tank for quite a bit. He's the last person to close out the action, and he says it's really nitty fold, but he's going to go ahead and fold. So let's just pause this for a second. Even though you're folding the hand and you're getting out of the hand, when a player says something like this is a really nitty fold, it does give away some information. So I encourage you guys, if you're watching this and you're going to fold and there's still action left to be held, please be professional about it and don't announce that it's a nitty fold. You might be saying, well, what kind of information can it convey? It can either convey that the guy had queen six, five, six, four, seven, eight, nut heart draw, something to that effect. It, it, it allows other players to know that he had something. So just in the future, if, if you're the guy that's folding, try not to do any table talk. So moving right along to the turn, the turn comes a black 10. Now that's actually a very safe card for our range and our opponent's range. When my opponent called, I figured he had some kind of wrap draw like four, seven, eight, or hearts. Now black 10 is a pretty clean card here. So in this situation right here, being that we've got queens and fives, and we do even have an over with an ace just in case he turned queen 10, I'm going to apply as much pressure as I can. So I announce pot. He ends up snap calling. So when he ends up calling, I'm thinking, that's all right. He's not the type of person to fold draws. He has an all day. River comes to six. At this point, I've only got $40 left. I tell him I'm not going to go anywhere, but I end up checking it to him. He checks it back, and he turns over a 6, 7, 8, 9 for the rivered three of a kind. As you can imagine, this session is going swimmingly well that I've made an appointment with the hospital because I'm getting beaten so badly during the session. Sometimes you're going to have sessions like this, and it just happens. And, you know, one of the things you should always do is if you have a principle, as you can see, I'm reloading chips during this hand, uh, is, you know, like one of my principles is three buy-ins. If I'm not doing it in three buy-ins, I should get up and leave. At this particular junction I think I'm in for four buy-ins maybe five but in any case jack jack 10 six not a bad hand we have pocket jacks one individual ends up raising it to thirty dollars now the person who ended up raising it to thirty dollars is super super tight so let's pause this for a second the individual who's super tight who happens to be in the eighth seat ends up checking it the board is king queen jack so we end up flopping a set we do have an open-ended straight draw when the person ends up checking it who happens to be the tightest guy on the table i'm thinking to myself he's probably got pocket aces he could represent ace 10 i'm gonna lead out and bet here if he check raises me in any form obviously i'm getting rid of the hand so it when it does check around to me i am gonna end up betting i mean we did flop a set flopping a set in omaha is pretty hard to do 
So I go ahead and I end up betting $60. At this juncture, I feel like I, do, I might have the best hand. I mean, the individual in front of the original Razor is going in the tank a little bit. Uh, it is a, uh, you know, a little bit of a draw-heavy board, but I do have a 10 for a blocker. I mean, it's king-queen-jack. It is a rainbow board, but this is definitely something that should favor the original Razor. Now, he snap calls. Now, when he snap calls, I'm actually thinking to myself, oh boy, I think this guy actually has pocket kings. So at this particular junction, I'm pretty much done with the hand unless an ace comes, uh, or a nine possibly, or of course a jack. So when the turn comes up, you know, it ends up coming up an eight. He ends up checking it over to me. And now at this particular time, I can do one of two things. I can either try to blow him off the pot right now. So stack to pot size ratio is very important. He's got about $400 in front of him or I can check it and then try blowing him off the pot on the river. So if he's a player that has like pocket kings and he already continued on the flop, he might continue on the turn if I decide to bet pot. I'm putting my opponent on pocket kings or pocket queens, which is what I put him on, then bombing the turn is not the right option. If I do want to try stealing this pot, I have to wait until the river card. So because of that, I end up electing to check behind uh, for that reason only. Because at this point, I don't think I have any showdown value. So the river comes out pretty clean for us. It's a deuce. Now I'm going to enact my action of let's go ahead and bomb the pot unless he decides to bet out. If he bets out, I'm pretty much getting rid of the hand. So when he checks here, again, I'm putting him on pocket kings, pocket queens. You know, his worst kind of hand is going to be like pocket aces with a queen and he just got sticky because... Let's face it, I'm a little bit of an action player. So in this situation, just in case he does have pocket kings or pocket queens, if I do a pot size bet, it will represent something like 9-10, uh, like some kind of weak straight. So that is what I end up doing. I turn my set of jacks into a bluff, uh, but I want to make it look a little value-y, so I make it like 165 just in case he decides to call. And he goes in the tank for a little bit. Again, like I said, he was the tightest player on the table. Uh, so he's a player that is capable of folding pocket kings here if he does have it. So he looks down at his cards and he ends up mucking. And this is one that we end up scooping, but I think we had to bluff to win it. So yeah, overall for the session, we end up down $6,000. Pretty brutal uh, when you think about being away from your family for a whole week and then coming back home and being like, hey, honey, I lost six grand. Sometimes that's the way in the life of a poker player. Let me know what you guys do to handle a big uh, loss of basically a, a whole week's worth of work and how you deal with it. Um, as always, everybody, play smart and run like a god.